right. Uh, Dr. Nathan Connolly is the Herbert Baxter Adams Associate Professor of History at Johns Hopkins University. Originally from South Florida, he received his BA from St. Thomas University in Miami. So he tells me that he's used to religion classes and things like that and prayer. Uh, where he graduated magna cum laude, uh, but some complained that he never managed to become a sufficiently rabid Miami Hurricanes fan, <laughs> which means that he probably won't feel too bad about being up at Sundance tonight while the AC ACC tournament is, is starting underway uh, this evening. Uh, Professor Connolly headed north and completed a master's at the University of Chicago in 2000 before moving on to the U University of Michigan for his PhD. He got more than an education there. He also met his wife, who was uh, getting her PhD in American Studies. Uh, and their first child was also born while there at Michigan. Uh, he's been a consultant in public, public schools and held positions at St. Thomas and NYU, as well as at Johns Hopkins, and is the author of a number of articles and book chapters that examine the intersections between race and urban history and politics, as well as the multiple award-winning A World More Concrete, Real Estate, and the Remaking of Jim Crow South Florida, which came out with, uh, with the University of Chicago Press in 2014. Won a number of awards, including uh, the Kenneth T. Jackson Award for the Best Book in North American Urban History, Liberty Legacy Foundation. Foundation Award from the OAH, the Bennett H. Wall Book Award from the Southern Historical Association, and a smattering of others that um, I won't mention here. Now, I read A World More Concrete when it first came out and was struck by the way it blends economic, political, and cultural history to examine the political culture of land liberalism and to show and really bring to life how this culture helped establish and sustain structural racism. And one of the things that I admired about this book is its clarity about the desires and ways of ordinary people and how they thought about things like property rights and citizenship, about their values and strategies and strengths. A World More Concrete is a deeply human story that gives us insight into the nature of society and community in Jim Crow America. It uncovers a history of Southern middle-class black Americans, some of whom were civic leaders, who helped shape a post-war liberal consensus about race and poverty that in some ways reinforced white power structures. There's no simple story. There, there never is, right? Dr. Connolly has also been a frequent contributor to public debates about some of our most pressing issues. He can be heard on WGH Boston's Here and Now program. In their latest episode, he tackled what's happening with Florida students and students across the country and the, the history of youth activism. He writes commentary for the New York Times and other media outlets. A recent piece for The Hollywood Reporter linked the new Black Panther film with a 500-year history of African-descended people imagining freedom, land, and national autonomy. And he does it without any spoilers. So if for some crazy reason you have not yet seen the film, you can read the article and get super excited, even more excited. Uh, he and his three kids, their daughters age 11 and 8 and son age 4, are huge Black Panther fans, so I'm guessing that they're thinking their dad is mighty cool now that he's making headlines uh, in association with, with that movie. Uh, Connolly is also a co-host of Backstory Radio, a weekly podcast started in 2008 by some of my former professors at the University of Virginia. It rips headlines out of the news and then takes us back in time to help us think about important topics from a variety of perspectives. Uh, you can check it out at backstoryradio.org. If you're professors, I make my students listen to some, so. Um, but, but it's a great, uh, great podcast. Uh, Connolly joined the team last year and has, in the words of one of the other hosts, energized backstory, infusing it with a perspective that nobody else can bring or predict. He is fearless when it comes to addressing difficult, complex issues that are not supposed to be conducive to public history platforms, yet he makes them so. I am told he tends to steal the show. Uh, he'll be addressing difficult, complex issues with us here today. I anticipate he'll do it in his usual fearless and unpredictable way. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nathan Connolly to BYU. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for that introduction. Um, this is my third time in the state of Utah in my life. I grew up watching a lot of basketball. I actually was like an old Orlando Magic fan. I lived with a Chicago Bulls fan. And at the time of my youth, the Bulls played Utah all the time. And it was pretty clear that Utah was always the toughest game on the road because everybody came out to jazz games in a way that they might not have come out in big markets like you know New York or Los Angeles. I came here as a 14-year-old. I actually was part of a wedding party where my aunt married my uncle my, by marriage. Um, he had a place in Heber City, and we lived, or I was there um, where they stayed, just across from the homestead 
resort. I was 14 at the time and totally knocked over as a kid from Florida with the majesty of the mountains, the crispness of the air, and all of that coming from my, my Florida swamp. So I'll show you a little bit of the Florida swamp piece today. But um, I came back again when I was in college. I was uh, basically an equipment manager and practice player with my college basketball team, which had the unfortunate um, scheduling of playing the University of Utah at home during their homecoming game. Again, folks came out. Now, the, ba the bad thing about that was we had, like, we were a S NAIA Division II team that had uniforms that looked like the University of North Carolina. <laughs> we had, like, literally imitation uniforms. And you would swear we were actually the Tar Heels, like, playing against the youths, the way that everybody, again, came out. So when I look at look out on this group that had standing room only, folks in two and three rooms now, um, folks come out. Folks come out to things, um, and I really, really appreciate the attendance um, and the support. Um, yeah, I hope we, hopefully we get a good conversation going with all this. So I've been doing a fair amount of time traveling over the course of my professional life. As historians, we get the opportunity to move backward in time and sometimes bring back artifacts, language, pictures, stories um, that can be at times unsettling to contemporary eyes. And so a lot of what I'll share with you this morning comes from an earlier moment where you know images were different, language might have been a little bit different, the kinds of debates that people were having might feel a little bit foreign, but I do want to walk through that with you all as a way to try to give us a more honest accounting of where we are and how we got to this point. As the title of the presentation today reflects, it's about rethinking. It's about taking a story that we think we know and kind of turning it on its head a little bit with slightly more granular, nose to the stone kind of research, which is the kind of research that his social historians try to do whenever they have the opportunity. Now, when you think about Jim Crow segregation, this is usually handled over some core piece of your U.S. survey course. You get some exposure to it as an uh, element of Southern history. Particularly ambitious teachers will try to fold it into a more general account of American history by trying to disconnect some of the assumptions about the South being a distinctly racist place from the realities of capitalism, inequality, geography around the country, and really around the world. But images like this are oftentimes quite intimately connected with what we imagine Jim Crow to be in our mind. I used to do this talk by actually carrying this physical Jim Crow sign around with me. Um, but over the course of the last seven years of giving variations of a talk coming out of a dissertation and later a book and now post book, it's just got damaged. So, so, I not, so now I just have to give you guys the image. But, but I, I'm always attentive to the fact that when people see the physical sign, it makes it immediately more real that this is something that did indeed happen, that there are people who are walking around who remember these kinds of signs, the way that you would have the picture of a university president on the wall or an image telling you which way the men's room was. This was part of the infrastructure, part of the built environment. But as such, these images also have a variety of mythologies wrapped up in them, and we tend to think about them as being, in some ways, a kind of frozen in time moment or frozen in time artifact with very little sense as to how it came to be. Now, the first really core piece of understanding Jim Crow and its signs and its other elements is really understanding what we already tell ourselves about this period. Now, the first kind of fact that we hold to be true is that Jim Crow segregation was imposed by whites onto black people and that blacks had no choice in the matter, that this was a, a case of blanket oppression rather than thinking about what is oftentimes the case in many places of inequality and relationships and family, that even Jim Crow is the product of negotiation, okay? And I want to be very clear about this because when you see a Jim Crow sign, understand that that is actually a response to, an improvement on, what is the default response to black presence in and around cities in this country, which is exclusion, which is exclusion. So when you get a colored only waiting room, that's a response to there being no waiting room at all in a train station or in a bus station. A water fountain that says colored only is there as a result of 
a compromise, a negotiation in, in, in replacing the absence of a black water fountain at all. The same was true of a variety of different aspects of Jim Crow life, that the response was nothing provided for people of African descent, especially in the late 19th century, as states across the South rewrote their state constitutions, made it very difficult for folks to level political um, rebuttals to exclusion, you had to enter into negotiations to get even these modest markers of apartheid install, installed. The second major assumption is that when Jim Crow signs come down, when we have a formal end to Jim Crow, it's largely because segregation was too expensive to maintain. You have a colored only waiting room, you need a whites only waiting room. You have a colored only car and a train, you need a whites only, and so forth. And the idea is that this doubling of everything across the South created such exorbitant costs that people could not, in fact, sustain Jim Crow economically. And ultimately, the seeds of its own demise were planted at the very foundation of the Jim Crow order. The third element that we tend to assume or tell when we talk about Jim Crow segregation is that segregation ended through a combination of moral arguments combined with its unsustainable economic costs. And we imagine, and again, our pantheon of individuals and heroic figures, that people stayed, stood on the corner and gave great speeches, that they won the argument about Jim Crow's demise largely on powerful, persuasive arguments. And so we don't have a way of really thinking through what may have come after the Jim Crow moment. I'll talk about each of these in turn. So the first point, as I mentioned, is to rethink how segregation emerges, that it emerges actually through interracial negotiation. Secondly, and this is extraordinarily important, segregation is profitable. It's profitable. People continue to think about segregation in ways that seemingly makes it impossible to sustain, but in fact, when you go into the mechanics of creating niche markets, of creating housing projects, of creating separate schools, a lot of this was done and sustained for 70, 80 years because people were making a ton of money from the process of segregation. And I'll go through some of that in quite intimate detail. The third piece, and this is also critically important, is that Key elements of the Jim Crow system, key aspects of segregation, are indeed ongoing. When the Jim Crow signs came down, when the water fountains were opened up, when public spaces seemed to be made available for everybody, regardless of background or skin color and color, you know, creed, there were other elements, the economic elements, the spatial elements, the geography of Jim Crow, the infrastructure of Jim Crow, that were allowed to remain in place. Again, we're talking about multiple decades of public policy, of political struggle that don't simply go away when you pull down a sign that says colored only. And so I'll try to explain how both at the level of American political culture and at the level of the built environment, segregation has been ongoing in ways that oftentimes falls below our radar. There we go. So right off the top, we have to appreciate that the Constitution is an impressive document that conveys rights. However, there are certain key absences in the Constitution as written that make it very difficult for people to assume a level of equal protections under the law. The first is that the Constitution is not very good on the question of civil rights. There's a whole slew of late 19th century court cases that are parsing out this very issue as to whether or not black people in this country can enjoy the benefits of citizenship. It was not until 1866 that they were named as citizens at all. The notion of birthright citizenship was written into the Constitution in the 14th Amendment. Now what's important to keep in mind in the absence of civil rights protections and in many cases very clear um, discussions of what citizenship meant legally, you had at the same time very ironclad protections of property. This is why property becomes so important for the way that Jim Crow evolves. Because even if black people can't vote, even if black people can't run for office, they can find ways to accumulate property. And there's actually a very rich literature about slaves owning property, slaves extending loans to their masters because they have certain kinds of assets. Obviously, it was not an equal relationship by any stretch of the imagination. But understand that capitalism was what allowed these interracial relationships to function and flow in the first place, and especially in the 19th century, where you see states rewriting their constitutions, and in some states, seeing a 99% drop in the number of black registered voters. The state of Louisiana had 130 
30,000 black voters in the 1880s, and in eight, by the 1890s, it had gotten down to 1,300. That's a decline of 99%, right? The disenfranchisement was so widespread that people moved toward property as the only sturdy foundation upon which to make their claims. And you have communities that emerge across the country in response to this political reality. Mount Bayou, Mississippi, areas like Rosewood, Florida, there are communities around the country that emerge, Boley, Oklahoma, that are built largely on interracial negotiation, the accumulation of property, having people who achieve a measure of economic success who can then make claims on different political actors to try to get modest benefits meted out to people of African descent. And this becomes the relationship that means the most important for generating what we can call economic growth, right? You need to have people buying property, have people be able to levy taxes on that property. You then build public infrastructure from those taxes and so on, right? So the idea that you would remove black folk from the political realm in no way, shape, or form remove them from the economic realm. This is very important, as I'll outline in a second. These are just some examples of these places. The other thing that was confusing for many people when they first engages history is to understand that when it's an economic relationship, you tend to turn on its head some of Jim Crow's foundational political logics. The most critical being that many African Americans and black immigrants who could buy property and hold it were sometimes barred through racist zoning laws from living on their property that they own. So you could have property that you could collect taxes on, but then you were prevented from building a house there, from having your family there, and so on. So what this actually does is create an opportunity for you to own land that whites, in fact, occupy as tenants. One of the most important elements of the Jim Crow political environment was that you had black capital and white tenants across the South, poor whites who literally paid every week to a black landlord poor whites who were employed by black business owners. This does not fit our usual understanding of how the Jim Crow system is supposed to work, right? So people who were disenfranchised in one context had political power in the workplace or when they showed up in the morning and knocked on the door to collect that rent. This is a lease agreement between a Mr. Dana A. Dorsey and two tenants, a Mr. Anthony and a Bogiages, who are both Greek immigrants, right? And all it's meant to reflect is this political reality, that these two whites were renting from an African-American business owner, and this was common across the South. And it created, again, a series of intimate ties that then helped to grease the wheels of other kinds of negotiations. It also fanned the flames of racial unrest. Because as you have an expectation that there should be a system of white over black, it also then means when there are moments of conflict that you have attacks on black property. In Rosewood, Florida in 1923, you had what by many accounts is described as a pogrom, a kind of mass expulsion of black business owners from a central Florida community. Eatonville, Florida was another one. Any of you who have read Zora Neale Hurston's work um, know that Eatonville is a very important black town. Central Florida was pocked with these black enclaves that were developed in the belly of Jim Crow, and Rosewood was an area that was attacked, largely as a, a consequence between a conflict between whites and blacks over gender issues and sexuality, which oftentimes these conflicts emerge, but they were always economic in nature. And any moment that one could take to basically turn the Jim Crow system back on its supposed proper footing became part of the political possibilities and dangers that this landscape included. Okay? Um, the other thing that's important to keep in mind about the racial violence, of course, is that you know, it also prompted many African Americans and whites to understand that gun culture was as critical as property culture in this period. And in, in many instances, you had 90% gun ownership among African Americans with the understanding that having a rifle in the house just helped to make sure that somebody respected you as an equal, right? So again, gun rights and property rights being critical in the absence of civil rights and voting rights. The conflict in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921 is one of the most dramatic episodes of the kind of programs that occurred in Rosewood. Basically, you know, you had a very affluent black district, what they called at the time Black Wall Street, that included black banks, that had black people owning oil wells. You had people, again, with massive real estate holdings and so forth. And you had black 
owners with white employees. And all of this became part of the conflict that emerged in Tulsa in 1921. Basically, it was a botched lynching that was thwarted when African Americans who were armed, who had drilled as military um, personnel during World War I, came and prevented there from being a lynching. It caused there to be an escalation of the violence. Some reports included stories of planes actually strafing black residents as they were fleeing the district, machine guns and the like. Um, there's also, very important to recognize here, a way in which whites understood that if you could attack the black bank and you could attack black homeowners, you could basically burn any evidence of their ownership. This is not an age of cloud computing. This is not an age when people had backups of this and that. And so to basically take a house and burn it to the ground was to burn any financial records that were contained therein. Many people took out the mink coats, they took out the record players, they took the automobiles and vehicles, and they burned any evidence of black ownership in Tulsa, Oklahoma during this period. What we're seeing is actually the consequences of a mass property transfer from black to white hands. And this is really important at a fundamental level culturally because one of the things that oftentimes is said about how one makes it in America is you build institutions, you create places to have ownership. Once you have ownership, you're supposed to basically be safe. Those rights are supposed to be protected. But the property rights that African Americans had, again, were only as strong as their negotiations with white power brokers at a given time and their ability to defend themselves militarily in many instances. So that became part of the political calculus of this period. The other thing that is presenting the atmosphere or providing the atmosphere at this moment is an idea that can best be described as white popular sovereignty. And we are in a democracy that believes that power in, in, is imbued first in the people and then from the people out to the state, right? We the people, thus and so. Now, what happens, of course, in the context of a, an economy and a society built on slavery is that idea of we the people gets racialized, right? The way in which you have political power does not simply happen with someone who's born as a liberal subject with no other history of values associated with their existence, right? There's a racial experience that gets mapped onto their political fortune. And so the idea that one could be an autonomous political actor or could run a political system with the people in mind was something that was constantly inflected through the lens of race. This, again, becomes really important in how we understand racial violence in this period. The problem of lynching and of lynch law, which was a corollary to these kinds of programs and expulsions, were about articulating and expressing that whites were in fact above the government. If the government did not prosecute properly in ways that it felt were um, in ways that seemed to be consonant with what whites as a mob wanted, then the mob had the right to legally take justice into its own hands. And you see images like this, and again, I apologize for it being somewhat uncomfortable, but it's important to bear in mind the comfort on people's faces as they're posing for this image, right? This is a crime that is actually done in the open. People would exchange postcards. Again, if any of you have, have taken courses where you explore some of these nuances, in some cases, people were given notices ahead of time. Meet at this location. There will be a lynching, right? And law enforcement officers would oftentimes be part of this violent act, in, in large measure not be having anything to do with even what they might have believed in their heart or mind, but knowing that they actually served at the benefit and at the pleasure of the mob, right? So the, the whole idea of a mob mentality becomes extraordinarily important for understanding how the political culture of Jim Crow works. You make deals and you make compromises and you make certain kinds of agreements only insofar as you suspect the mob will allow. And this becomes a critical element in the way that policy is written, not just in the 1890s or 19-teens, but through the 1940s and 50s. And I'll talk a little bit about the housing issue in a moment, but understand, for instance, the United States government segregated its blood supplies during World War II, an elaborate and expensive project. And the military brass that was in charge of this procedure knew the science very well. There's no scientific difference between black and white blood. But they thought that white Americans would lose their minds right in the streets and basically help demobilize the war effort if they learned that white troops were getting blood from black donors. This is one of the most important 
episodes in American history because it demonstrates that it's not about the science, it's not about military strategy, it's not about the budget, but it's about a certain fear of this kind of mob action creating chaos. And this happens again when you talk about the history of housing segregation. It happens again around issues of law and order. It's one of the most important elements in determining what state actors elect to do. How will the mob basically respond to our actions? Will we maintain our legitimacy as a governing body if we do something that falls out of step with what the masses effectively want? Now understand, at the same time that you have this environment of popular sovereignty, racialized popular sovereignty, there's also pushback. What we would call now kind of liberalism or government protections of people's individual rights comes into this moment and is partly about trying to get rid of lynch law as an acceptable form of political expression. This image captured from Puck Magazine in 1899 is about this relationship between black subjects and a state that's meant to protect them against the lynching you know, colonel in this case, right? Um, but that the lynch mob is in some ways a threat to effective governance. So this becomes a really important way that people who are lobbying for reform said we want to take violence out of mob hands, we want to take the way in which our society is run out of this bloodletting environment and create a much more disciplined, formalized governing structure. And this will drive what becomes liberal, liberal policy through the 1930s and 40s, the idea that we need to professionalize all of the elements that were done in an ad hoc, grassroots fashion. Don't maintain racial order by lynching. Maintain order through policing. Maintain order through effective urban planning. Maintain order through having a banking system that distributes mortgages in an effective and efficient way. All of this was meant to maintain elements of the racial peace. Ida B. Wells is obviously a very important crusader in this period because she's one of the few people who's making the argument explicitly about the realities of white popular sovereignty and its dangers. She's in fact accredited with being the person who establishes and creates investigative journalism as a field. She's going to lynching sites. She's doing the research at a time when even the most decorated journalists at the New York Times and the major papers in the country already seem to know what happens in so many of these moments of lynching without even having been to the location, right? So Ida B. Wells is challenging what counts as objective journalism, but also, again, putting boots on the ground and creating an atmosphere where black voices about what's going on are considered to be more credible because she's actually done the groundwork. Through the 1920s, obviously, you have various articulations of white popular sovereignty. There's still a concern about lynching, and there's still a concern that the, the various forms of shadow governments that exist are really what are in charge. The Klan at its high water moment in the 1920s was considered to be the shadow government of the United States. Again, the governing body that's more in charge than the federal government itself. Now, it, that, in fact, was not true, but there are key places around the country where if you wanted to be a police officer, for instance, you had to be a member of the Ku Klux Klan. There was no choice in the matter. And it wasn't just in places like Mississippi or Florida, but in Detroit, Michigan, and Chicago as well, right? North and southern cities. Detroit would actually run openly Klan slates for local office and win, like mayor's office and so forth. Um, the Klan was an actual like political party um, for much of the early part of the 20th century. Now, as the liberal reform movements are picking up steam in the 1930s, this problem of racial violence is still kind of at the margins. If I come out for the anti-lynching bill now, Southern congressmen will block every bill I ask Congress to pass and keep, um, to keep America from collapsing. I just cannot take that risk. So even uh, somebody who is a sympathizer with the problem of racial violence, as was FDR, there's a problem of the way that the Congress is structured, the seniority system in the Congress, which is dependent upon black disenfranchisement. The longest running congressmen were those folks who had the safest seats, those environments that were the greatest you know, number of black folk were disenfranchised. So it was an actual gridlock on the question of lynching um, and whether or not you could actually get anti-lynching put forward. Oftentimes then what happened was you had, again, negotiations behind the scenes. People like Mayor McLeod Bethune, pictured here, who's from Florida, very good friends with Roosevelt's wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, trying to push forward other kinds of modest gains. This was not going to be done in the halls of Congress, but rather through backdoor meetings and such. Roosevelt, Eleanor that is, was actually really responsible for helping to create what we now call the Black Cabinet or you know, the Federal Council on Negro Affairs. This was the first time in the 1930s when African Americans began to assume some measure of political power formally in the federal government since really the 19-teens where Woodrow Wilson had massively basically demoted any black person working within the federal government. So you had a multiple decade stretch that was then ended by this creation of a Black Cabinet. 
But it's also important that this was considered to be, again, another negotiating body. They, they weren't going to topple Jim Crow. They weren't going to end housing segregation. They had to distribute goods and services on a very modest plane to local um, constituents. One observer, a labor organizer and a reporter for the New York Times, a man named George Streeter, actually compared Roosevelt's black cabinet to the chiefs operating in Africa as part of the imperial system there under the British. Will not all these black bureaucrats behave precisely as Britain's Nigerian chiefs and priests, right? So again, there's a sense that there is a possibility for greater gains to be made if people didn't elect to negotiate within these backroom channels. Of course, the on the whole, the New Deal was a very important bundle of policies and programs to try to basically end rural poverty, to try to provide pathways to the middle class for Americans across the racial spectrum. Um, and it was really important, too, for ending a certain kind of you know, ancient agrarian life that existed in the rural confines of the South. This is just one example of the kinds of farming programs that existed to help black farmers specifically. The New Deal pr basically provides the starting point for understanding the profitability of segregation. Now, has anybody seen one of these maps before? Who knows what this is? We've got a few people. OK, good. Maps that were created by the Homeowners Loan Corporation in the early 1930s were used to assess the riskiness of real estate in a, basically over 250 cities around the country. The Homeowners Loan Corporation then provided these maps to the Federal Housing Administration, both of which operated under the Home Loan Bank Board. Are you confused yet? Um, all of these agencies worked together to try to basically rebuild the American economy during the Great Depression. Now, this map has a very clear grading system. This is just one um, sample from Oakland, California. And you see red areas, green areas, yellow areas, and blue areas. Green neighborhoods, or A neighborhoods, were new, all white, specifically non-Jewish, and they were in demand in good times and bad. B neighborhoods were still desirable, stable with only some Jewish presence. I'm pulling this directly from the underwriting manual, by the way. This is how folks talked about race back in the day. Um, C neighborhoods are definitely declining or in danger of black migration. And uh, so the C neighborhoods and D neighborhoods, areas in which the things taking place in C areas have already happened. And as taken from the manual, if a neighborhood is to retain stability, it is necessary that property shall continue to be occupied by the same social and racial classes. A change in social or racial occupancy generally leads to instability and a reduction in values. Now, what does this mean? You could not live in a racially integrated neighborhood if you wanted to, if you wanted to. It's not actually a feature of your individual choice because the entire local real estate economy was operating on an elaborate system of levers and pulleys that determined whether or not a neighborhood reached an unsustainable or risky level. It made it against your economic interests to live in an integrated neighborhood because the idea was that no one would then buy your property. You would have difficulty being able to get any improvements. Local zoning boards would make it hard for you to even get permits to do basic housing construction. All of these things would accompany the possibility of living in one of these D neighborhoods. Now, the maps themselves are also part of this history of property transfer, and this is a piece that's oftentimes overlooked. When you have D neighborhoods, it's not just about not being able to get a mortgage. You also weren't getting a government bailout. People who lived in A and B neighborhoods, if they were distressed in their mortgage, they couldn't make their payments, they actually got cash infusions from the government to keep those houses. If you lived in a D neighborhood, you didn't get those infusions. Instead, your property was foreclosed on and handed to a real estate speculator. A massive property transfer, again, from black and white hands, happened as a consequence of the Great Depression. The high watermark in this country of black home ownership is the 1920s. It never re reached the levels of the Great Depression. Now, how did that happen? Remember what I said earlier, the impulse to own property was considered to be the strongest foundation upon which to build one's rights. So people were buying property all the time, even if it was something as modest as a one-room shack. They tried to own the land under their feet. Obviously, a number of people still were forced to rent. But as a result of the dis Depression, people failing to meet even basic economic demands, people lost their houses en masse. By one count, over 130,000 properties were transferred private to private as a consequence of just one federal agency's policies, the HOLC. Add to that the FHA, which basically gave 97% of all of its mortgages to whites only, and you're talking about a very clear disparity in how the federal government is responding to the problem of poverty during the Depression. 
This is my hometown of Baltimore, Maryland. Very similar area. Um, in the middle there, red, yellow, blue, and then green. I live in the green neighborhood now. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> now, the housing that's in these red areas were of the most deplorable sort. Okay? They had wood construction when concrete construction had already been established. They oftentimes had no indoor facilities in terms of plumbing. They had no way to keep out pests. They had oftentimes unpaved streets. And what's most amazing about this condition is that this was the most profitable housing in America. When you have a confined population with very few options, it makes it extraordinarily easy to gouge those populations. How many folks here go grocery shopping at the airport? Go clothes shopping at the airport? Nope, nobody does that. Um, how many people here have been to Disney World? Okay. Now, as a kid, when you go into Disney World, it depends upon how well your parents are doing, right? When I went to Disney World, I got the speech. Some of you may have gotten the speech, <laughs> right? <laughs> Don't ask for nothing, don't touch nothing, you ain't getting nothing, not no Mickey ears, not no ice cream cone. Like, you know, some, some folks get the speech, some folks don't get it. Sometimes your parents like reach a threshold, like so you start getting stuff and then it's like, oh, you're done now, you're cut off, right? Now, understand, when you go into the airport, you are going through those security gates and you're not getting back out. So everything through those gates costs more. Even all of the clothing, even all of the food, right? Anybody tries to buy anything, once you go through those gates, it's like I'm stuck having to pay whatever the exorbitant price is. I, as I'm coming out here, I pay $22 for a salad with steak on top, <laughs> right? So you know how that goes. Likewise, when you go through those gates at Disney World, Everything costs more. I, I went during the time when they said film for cameras, right? So I remember having to buy film and it being like $20 for like a roll, two rolls of film or something. But like e everything, again, the food, all the trinkets, everything costs more because once you go through those gates, your options are cut off. Living in the Jim Crow South was like living in Disney World without the rides, right? Once you're stuck behind the walls of segregation, finance discrimination, you were stuck paying more for less. There was nowhere else you could go. Your options were cut off. In 1949, you rented one of these kinds of tar paper, plywood, rat-ridden shacks for the same price of a beachfront hotel in Miami, okay? In fact, a beachfront hotel in Miami cost $17.50 a week. You paid $18 a week for one of these. So it was actually more expensive to live on the black side of the color line, okay? This is what's important to keep in mind in order to understand the kinds of profits that are generated by creating niche markets. When people are racially excluded from certain kinds of options, it then allows you to charge whites more because they don't want to live in bad parts of town, quote unquote, and you charge people who are of African descent more because they don't have the option because you have mobs and bankers and police and people confining them, and sometimes it was actual concrete walls that were built around communities, green spaces, right, that were so far and long that you wouldn't dare cross them. All of this was part of, again, the Jim Crow landscape to make the country economically prosperous, coming out of the depression. You want people buying houses, you want them furnishing, you want landlords getting profits that then turn into investments in their churches and their schools and their various country clubs. All of this is generating cash. The creation of niche markets, segregation generating profits. In response to some of this, people tried to create a public option in the same way that you talked about the healthcare debate, needing a public option. Public options actually depress gouging, gives somebody else a choice. In this case, Liberty Square became the first public housing project in America built in my hometown of Miami, Florida, my younger hometown. And it was spearheaded by people who were working in conjunction behind closed doors negotiating the black cabinet with white housing reformers. Now these were segregated houses. As a rule, public housing was not allowed to be racially integrated. But if you wanted to get it built, you had to compromise on that front to get an option put forward for people of African descent. Now, concurrent with these negotiations and compromises is, of course, culture and the playing out of fantasies about 
how the racial order should remain intact. Don't be so concerned about the Democratic Party and their various socialistic policies and programs. Have a little bit of escapism and go see Gone with the Wind, right? There's a way in which people began to get reinvested in these ideas about happy darkies, about plantation life, about you know, not being too concerned with the government complicating our normal way of being. Again, the racial order, which was certainly threatened with a mass demo demotion of people's economic wherewithal with the Depression, could still be enjoyed in these kinds of pageants. right? As the post-war economy began to tick up, again, you begin to see people asserting their own sense of political power, again, popular sovereignty. We want white tenants in our community. Here's another one of these kind of curious problems, right? White landlords were always seeking out black tenants. Why? That now should be pretty clear. You get the most money from having black tenants. Black tenants have the fewest options. That meant that white tenants and white homeowners were constantly worried about white real estate speculators foisting black renters on them. One of the most critical fault lines of conflict were actually between white homeowners and white landlords who had different economic interests around the question of where black people are supposed to live, right? So you get signs like this around the country. We only want white tenants in our community because the danger was black folk on their own can't do this. But a, a white person with enough money to buy my block and change the community in ways that could cause them to make money, they're a real threat, right? They're a real threat. Miami is one of a number of different cities that had these very concentrated districts here. You see very quickly the Central Negro District reflected, and it was imagined that it would be completely redeveloped as to make a new city, a new Miami in this case. And cities around the country, in Chicago, in New York, in Atlanta, in California, were constantly imagining ways that the federal government could get involved in changing the Jim Crow landscape because it was causing too many problems. You had children who were dying in house fires. You had people who were still suffering on, from malaria and all these old world diseases, right? This was a public relations disaster in many instances. But slum landlords, with their profits, with their lawyers, with their lobbying groups, were oftentimes too strong to prevent there from actually being reform. And many black homeowners who lived in and among the tenements knew that it was in fact the white landlords who were protecting their properties from being taken away and liquidated, as maybe their grandfather's property was taken away in Tulsa, Oklahoma. You see what I'm saying? There's actually generational memory about displacement that makes landlords seemingly the friends of black homeowners. Again, try to follow these various compromises and relationships. Now, of course, the post-war economy is one in which people are going on vacations, they're building suburbs, you have consumer culture happening in a variety of different ways. It's just meant to kind of reflect the fact that you have these massive suburban developments that are emerging everywhere, bedroom communities. As these communities expanded, they oftentimes pushed up against existing black enclaves. And, uh, and again, uh, in, in the interest of time, I'll try to be as quick as I can on this. In 1947, this is just one example, a community in Miami called Railroad Shops, Colored Edition, which was based a black worker community, um, was taken by city planners who wanted to make space for a white community that wanted to be sure that their neighborhood wasn't going to fall to real estate risk by being too close to black tenants. I've seen the actual city commission meetings on this. I've seen the arguments, the gavel banging, the whole shebang. And basically what happens is they say, okay, the only way we're allowed to legally take this property, and this, in this case it was about 100 homeowners in, in total, is if we use it for a public good through the power of eminent domain. And so they took black houses during a rainstorm, put people out into the street, pulled up trees from the ground and sold those to a grower. Some people who could afford to negotiate to have their physical house moved had it put on the back of a flatbed truck and relocated to another part of the region, only to have it summarily wiped away by the hurricane of 1947 because it had no foundation, right? And all of this happened in the context of post-war growth. We want the economy to grow and prosper. They used a whites-only school called the Andrew Jackson School. And the um, local firehouse, which was again for whites only, is part of this infrastructure. And so the point, of course, is that our job as a governing body is to make sure that the citizens who are here who, that really matter, who could possibly create a stink, again, go back to our earlier point about lynch law, right? The, we need to make sure that they're happy with the way that growth is being run. And that came oftentimes at the expense of those black owners who didn't have proper legal representation. As I mentioned earlier, by turns, you also did have folks who were opening up new areas. And this is one of the most important 
reasons why you have black suburbs that emerge, like Compton, California, like the Summer Hill neighborhood um, in Georgia, places in Kentucky and so forth, where it's literally black and white entrepreneurs trying to invest in new visions of black suburban life. These suburbs were oftentimes just like white suburbs in the sense that they were meant to be bedroom communities, they were meant to be concrete construction, they were meant to have green spaces, hopefully better schools. And this was the way that growth was going to happen through compromise and negotiation. Through the 1950s, so many different black neighborhoods were built with these relationships developing between white and black entrepreneurs. These black suburban spaces were also places where black celebrity culture was celebrated and elevated. Here we have Billie Holiday with a group of local teachers in Miami being part of what would hopefully for them be an acceptable display of middle class black life. The, the whole point was to show that we could have a black corollary or a black parallel to what we knew was a white existence, right? So we want to be able to do this in ways that show that we too can have the finest things. Oh, and, and in this case in particular, that included having a black domestic, right, in the far corner. Leisure destinations, black college football games, hotels, all of this was developed through the 1950s and 60s, all on a segregated basis, all through compromises happening between entrepreneurs. This is the Hampton House Hotel that was owned by a white landlord, um, the Markowitz family. Um, the Mary Elizabeth Hotel down here was owned by black landlords. And there are all these amazing correspondences between black and white landlords about what they could do to invest in their communities. It's funny, there's one of the other myths about the Jim Crow era is of this idea of kind of the golden ghetto that you know, black folk owned their own spaces and they had their own communities and this and that. Um, that was never true. And, and there was no point at which white ownership wasn't the majority of ownership in black communities. In the case of Miami, it was 70% white ownership of the central Negro district. White people recognized that there was always going to be a market wherever black folk were congregated. And so, and to be very clear about this too, when we talk about you know, owning our own community, a lot of that is simply laying the table for people to not have options. And I'm happy to talk more about this during the Q&A in terms of solutions, but it's always very important to give people options because when capital is able to move, people should be able to move just as easily. And when people can't move, and money can, that's when you create moments of exploitation, right? This is how you have a disconnect. So this figure is one of the most important for just understanding how Jim Crow worked on a day-to-day -day basis. I'll probably, I'll probably skip through a couple of slides here. His name is Luther Brooks, and he's actually a southern Georgia businessman who began driving a bus for a mental hospital in the state of Florida, eventually became the owner of a property management firm that managed over 14,000 different rental units in the state of Florida. Half of all the black people living in Florida lived in a property managed by Luther Brooks. He said, I get my money from Negroes. I owe it to them to help them. He tapped into very old ideas about paternalism and support. And with the money that he made, he put on debutante balls. He's actually the person who helped to open up black college football. This is him giving a jacket to the head coach of Florida A&M University for a photo op. Here's the letter where he's detailing that. I'll, I'll skip that. Um, here, here's Luther Brooks giving a check to a local black daycare. Here is one of Luther Brooks's tenants providing Christmas dinners for the residents there. And you can see chicken, cranberry sauce, cake, peas, corned beans, loaf of bread, and so forth. A lot of food to basically make your holiday a happier one. Again, segregation was never about separation. It was about these relationships that were economic and sometimes exploitative, and other times, you know, complementary, depending on who the people were involved in them. As the 40s turned into the 50s, of course, the old forms of white popular sovereignty continued to be chipped away at. Klan marches were considered to be beyond the pale. You couldn't wear hoods after a while in the early, early 1950s. You couldn't burn crosses. All of this began to be legislated out of Southern life. The Ku Klux Klan, almost a joke in the New South. This is basically 25 years after that mass march in DC, right? At the same time, you still had a kind of genteel property politics. This is a telegram written to the governor of Florida in 1951. As a property owner in Miami, will you please help us in our fight to protect the homes from infiltration of the colored race? Signed, Anna Norcross, 751 Northwest 63rd Street. This one is a little bit more explicit. Don't want nigger neighbors in Edison Center. Let's get them out or else riot. Again, sign Mr. and Mrs. Fred Coleman, 1052 Northwest 65th Street. You could have language like this 
and a telegram sent to the governor with your name and address attached in 1951, right? So anybody ever ask you if there's been racial progress? There's been racial progress, certainly, right? Um, however, it's important to keep in mind that even nested within this more vitriolic form of racism is the property question, right? The concern that the presence of black folk means a reduction of one's property values. As happened in other places, in Miami, the, these telegrams basically preceded terrorism and explosions and bombings in black um, housing projects. This one was actually unoccupied, but it's important to bear in mind that the entire post-World War II period had as much racial terrorism as it did, with explosions in particular, because you had people who were trained in munitions development in World War II who brought that explosives training to the home front. And the people who were fighting back against that kind of terrorism were oftentimes black veterans who had discernible mil military training and running patrols, right? This particular development was called Little Korea as a way to mark its connection to the Korean War. So there's never really a disconnect between the international front and the home front on this very basic question. So again, just moving a little bit more quickly, economic pressures seem to create problems in the wake of the bombing at the housing project there in 1951. Groups in the North talk about boycotting Miami as a tourist destination. There seems to be a sense that the old racist language is not really acceptable anymore, so now when you want to use certain kinds of language, you have to hide your face at least when the photographer decides to come by, right? You'll carry a sign, but you don't want anybody taking your picture with the sign. Seems kind of absurd to me. Um, I love color photos of the Jim Crow era because it helps to collapse the perceived chronologic difference between our time and their time. One of the things that, that the colored only signs do, the black and white images do, is it makes us very comfortable in our current moment, right? As we, as we move into the third act here quickly, I want you to be very you know, clear about the notion that this was a full color system that existed in every way, shape, or form in the way that you exist now. These are a, a series of images, just two quickly, by Gordon Parks that just helped to hammer home what the day-to-day -day life was like under a Jim Crow infrastructure, right? Um, again, bringing back some of the language just so you can hear it spoken is obviously very upsetting. Seeing the images of lynching is very upsetting. And that little twinge that you feel is about that collapsing of time and space. This is, this is extraordinarily important. We don't really understand us as a kind of viewing audience sitting in theater seats watching the civil rights movement play out on screen. But when you, when you hear and you feel how real it was for people, it moves you into the pageant, right? Jim Crow's afterlife. When you have the emergence of black elected officials, you have, again, the mounting effort to try to streamline and improve the racial politics of the country. All of this comes to a head largely around the transition from white political to black political power in key cities, but also more suburbanization and more debates about the rights around property. This is f former Cleveland Mayor Carl Stokes um, talking about a shift in the language that's coming out of this civil rights struggle. Right? America no longer talks about spicks and wops and niggers, but rather talks about density and overcrowding of schools to achieve the same purpose. One of, one of the chief contributions of the civil rights movement was that it won a certain moral argument by changing the way we talked about language. It actually undercut most forcefully the theological justifications for segregation, which were many. Right? The Bible says that the birds should, and the trees should not mingle and so on and so forth. Mongolization is a sin against God and all of that. There was a very important contribution made by black ministers in this period to change the theological ability of people to justify segregation. But there were still the infrastructural elements, the zoning, the school locations, and so forth, right? Stokes tried to find a way to remake some of the Jim Crow problems in Cleveland by basically trying to salvage urban renewal. And urban renewal as a policy, which was the federal government's way of drastically remaking the faces of cities by bulldozing communities, by creating new zones for investment, by transferring property in some cases, it was argued that it would be a integration project. We talk now about displacement in a very tragic sense or Negro removal, but at the time it was seen as being a benefit. This is Miami's central Negro district that I pictured earlier. Here it is with the interstate highway planted squarely in it. 50,000 people displaced. 
The suburbs that were meant to be this promised land became sites of excessive policing. Landlords found ways to cash out their investment with the eminent domain payments they got and simply rebuilt the housing projects in the black suburbs that were built during the 1950s. So the ghettos of the 60s had been the promised lands of the 1950s. In the case of Miami in particular, you had these moments where you could try to basically have a public show of solidarity. The establishment of the Athlete Range under Expressway Park, yes, you heard correct, a park under the expressway, was meant to basically be a fine gift um, to the black community. And that was named after the black woman pictured here and members of the NAACP who all negotiated for this land to be conferred, right? Ribbon cuttings and happiness. Um, and no, this is actually the black newspaper talking about the park. Great idea, Commissioner Range, right? Um, on the same picture, um, where that, the same page where that picture emerges, you see Luther Brooks figuring prominently. He still made his money and found ways to cash out of a, a very unseemly real estate economy. Um, I'll, I'll take one more minute just to, to wrap this up, just to, just to make the following uh, point, um, that we have certain elements um, still part of this current political time. Um, comments about busing that were made with mass direct action were always first and foremost about protecting people's property interests and their neighborhood schools and doing it in a way that was keeping folks segregated. Lee Atwater, who was a Republican strategist in the 1980s, very much like Carl Stokes, was well aware of how you could change the conversation by simply changing the vocabulary. You're not quoting me. This actually gets recorded by a reporter during a, a, a moment of, of, of honesty. You're all not recording me on this now, are you? And then he's like, no, no, no. <laughs> he's like, you, you start out in 1954 by saying nigger, nigger, nigger. By 1968, you can't say nigger. That hurts you. It backfires. So you say stuff like forced busing, states' rights, and all that stuff, and you're getting so abstract. Now you're talking about cutting taxes and all these things. You're talking about are totally economic things. And the byproduct of, of them is blacks get hurt worse than whites. We want to cut this is much more abstract than even the busing thing, and a hell of a lot more abstract than nigger nigger. Any way you look at it, race is going to be on the back burner. Right? And this becomes the playbook for Republican politics in many instances, but, but even what become Democratic Party politics um, in the later part of the 20th century. You don't talk about racism. You don't use explicit language to talk about segregation. You instead talk about it in abstract terms that are economic and about playing. This is coming directly from the mouth of the, the chief strategist of the Republican Party at the time. Um, I'll skip past the point about pricing um, and just, and just leave, leave one last articulation um, of, of white popular sovereignty in our own time and something to be mindful of. Many of you remember this image from the Barack Obama campaign of 2008. And at the time, there was no real danger that Obama represented to the governing order because we hadn't desegregated the presidency yet. When he won the election and was then running for re-election in 2012, you saw the same visual grammar of white popular sovereignty brought. This was basically a meme that was created by Republican strategists in an office that was then moved over email servers. Some of you may remember the scandal. Mitt Romney had to come out and forcefully condemn what was found on the hard drives of Republican staffers. But this was meant to be a very clear articulation of the reassertion of the proper order of things. And, and again, it's not enough to just think about this as an act of racial violence. You have to think about the political act of lynching and what it represented from the standpoint of folks who believe that we are the people and they are not, and they are not. And that's very much the same terrain in which we're currently occupying. At the level of the vocabulary, who gets to count as being the real America, as the American people, as the heartland? A lot of this is still very much wrapped up in this iconography. I thank you all for your attention, and I look forward to your questions. Okay, I know that some of you, some folks have already had to leave, and a few of you are um, gonna rush off to class, but we'll spend a few minutes with Dr. Connolly uh, in questions if you can stay. Please come to the microphone on this side of the room. And if you're in the lobby, there's some seats that, are, uh, that have now op opened up. You can come in. Hey, again. Hi, Melody. How are you? This isn't on, but <laughs> um, I just wanted you to reiterate some of the things we were talking about last night of how um, whites, um, so we were talking about Black Panther and how 
the white community has been so receptive to this imagination of black property and um, black mm. excellence. When we've had Rosewood and we've had Tulsa, like you talked about before, and how those things haven't been allowed to exist. So how do we um, understand the negotiation that you're talking about today that happened mm. to make Black Panther a reality that was pal acceptable for white audiences? Right, the, the, the folks hear that question? I, 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 the question is, how, how is it that a film like Black Panther became so popularly accepted and, wi and widely um, loved, given that there's a history of people being virulently opposed to black property ownership, black land, and, and, and various forms of black representation? And it's, it's important that for, for a couple of, of key elements to be brought to the fore right off the bat. Right. Black Panther is the 18th film in a sequence of films by the Marvel Comic Studios. And it's safely embedded in a, a, a series of films that people want to keep watching as they watch the epic of the Marvel storyline play out. So right off the top, you've got a kind of disarming element where people are going to want to come to see where Wakanda, where T'Challa, where, where all of the Black Panther characters fit into this broader story. And, and in fact, you see in the trailers for the new Infinity War coming out, now I think it's been moved up to late April, um, you know, showing that Wakanda is playing a central role. Just as a quick aside, if you listen to some of the promotional interviews with Robert Downey Jr., with um, Chadwick Boseman, with uh, who's the dude who plays, um, I always forget his name, Mark Ruffalo, um, you know, when they're talking about Black Panther, it's like, Black Panther's coming out, but get ready for the next big thing, right? It's, it's, like, it's, it's, a pit, it's a pit stop on the way to this much more important movie. We have now have seen how Black Panther has performed at the box office, and it, by, by every measure, it's blown people's expectations away. Now, there's a, there's a lot of reasons to account for that, but specifically on the question as to why whites are comfortable seeing the film relative to the history that we've seen play out, it's that the, the filmmakers are very careful to do a couple of key things. One was, as I mentioned earlier, placing it within a larger series. The second is that when you have any explicit mention of the word white in a way that is meant to say, you know, I mean, this is, this is Shuri talking, you brought another white boy for me to fix, or don't scare me, colonizer, right? Th 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 those statements are meant to be funny. They, they come out of the mouth of a, a relatively young character. They're not coming out of Killmonger's mouth. They're not coming out of the mouth of Njaka, I'm sorry, of uh, Njobu, um, Killmonger's father. They're coming out in a way that are meant to trigger jokes. And there's a really, really brilliant book, actually written by um, Phil Deloria, called Indians in Unexpected Places. And he does this deconstruction of a woman who has Native American pigtails, red cloud woman, and she's under a hair dryer from the 1950s, and you laugh at the image. And he unpacks why certain things become funny and disarming. Um, the, the fact that the, the explicit mentions of race as a category for whites comes out of Shuri's mouth makes it more funny than it is threatening. Secondly, when they do have these more tense moments about colonialism, about discrimination, mass incarceration, police brutality, it's written in a way where it's all passive voice, right? So T'Challa says to Killmonger, you are about to become just like those who you oppose. There's no actor in that statement, right? When uh, the, the father figure in the opening scene is talking about mass incarceration, they are incarcerated, they are over-policed. It's, again, a passive voice construction, right? This, this is extraordinarily important. We as historians, we learn this all the time, that when you write in passive voice, it obliterates responsibility. And screenwriters are in a profound pickle because they want to capture a historical element, the historical element of Black Panther, is that it's about colonialism and discrimination. It's a response to that. The comic book was written that way. However, in order to have broad appeal, you actually can't make it historical in any explicit sense. So you have it in a fictional nation like Wakanda, not an actual African country with its own history of colonization, right? You don't talk about the, the forms of discrimination in ways that could be redressed in, on, on the, 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 the screen. And you offer solutions in the case of T'Challa going to East Oakland and buying three buildings. That's the way of basically solving the problem of discrimination, even though he literally has a bottomless pit of the most valuable metal on the planet at his disposal, right? Um, <laughs> We're not, we're not going to talk about it. And, and he has to go to the UN. He actually needs to go to this body who then puts him on the, on the stump and says, well, what can you offer us from this country, right? So he has to engage in this kind of you know, display. So all this to say that this, this need to reduce the, any mentions of explicit whiteness to humor, any more incendiary mentions of white power to passive voice, 
to reduce the ability of people to think and see a, sympathetically a historical argument about racism and colonialism and discrimination, and to basically put on the front burner the notion that the only kinds of solutions to this are done in ways that we already accept as being mainstream. All of that is part of what makes the film broadly acceptable. And, and that's to take nothing away from the brilliance of the costumes, of the acting, of the set design. Right? All of that is, is, is in there. And if you look at the history of black cinema, that doublespeak is always part of it from the 19 teens and really 1902. Um, and you know, blackface minstrelsy was trying to do this kind of play through you know, the late part of the 20th and now 21st century. So, so it's very much like Gone with the Wind as well, where the cultural texts shine a light on what's permissible and acceptable and the kinds of stories we need to see in the here and now. And, and the question is always, what kind of political options are foreclosed by the culture, by the, by the way that this is represented on screen? So thank you. Dr. Connolly, um, I wanted to ask, you briefly talked about the giving people options as far as exploitation of the yeah. property rights. Can you elaborate on the details of how we can provide more options to these people? Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, this, is, this is a really important um, and complicated history around taxes, around taxes. Because when the country was depressed, during, the, during the, the Great Depression and you, it was an emergency situation, people were expecting the government to respond, right? They wanted there to be um, you know, land agents who were helping them with really basic needs. You had obviously public health. You had you know, oral history projects that were being funded by the federal government to simply put people who even made artistic work no, murals and like, to, to work, right? I mean, so many projects around this country were built with federal money to try to put people in a position to have a livelihood, right? It created employment options for people because the private sector was not providing them. Now, what happened over the course of the 20th century is that as the federal government, through negotiations, direct action, various compromises, and so forth, was forced to become increasingly responsive to the needs of people of color, the government itself became suspect. Right? We tended to think about welfare in the 1930s as necessary. Welfare in the 1960s was a wasted expenditure because welfare agents began to be much more responsive to the needs of folks of color. Right? You had people who were literally opting out of school districts because they were deciding to desegregate schools. The state of Virginia closed their schools for a year because it was threatened to be desegregated racially. You did not have private schools in this country. And certainly not to the, to the scale. You had maybe, you know, Phillips Exeter. You had a few isolated East Coast boarding schools. But you did not have private schools in this country until people began to threaten to enforce the Brown decision and to desegregate public education. Folks then began opting out to a variety of different segregation academies or parochial schools, right, Christian schools that could be used to basically justify segregation on religious grounds as opposed to racial grounds, right? All of this happened. And there's a really rich literature on this transition from a system that was providing viable public options in education and housing and employment and having those options disappear. And every time those options disappear, it makes it then easier to provide private sector options at gouging rates to people who don't have the ability to move to where the best resources are. So what do you see in this country relative to something like banking? You have check cashing stores, right? Some of the worst check cashing areas are stores that are built literally outside of the walls of historically black colleges and universities. Are there any check cashing stores in the immediate vicinity of BYU? There are. Are there, are there any um, rental properties that folks are living in as students off campus that are probably more expensive than what you'd have to pay on campus? Right? OK. How many of you are paying a higher tax rate as somebody who does not own a house or does not employ workers? You're paying probably 35% of your income, even if it's a student wage income, to the government, right? Now, all of these systems, regressive tax systems, the, the check cashing systems, the rental systems, all of these were expanded as a consequence of the Jim Crow system. There's a great parable about the miner's canary, right? The, miner, the, the canary in the coal mine is what the miners brought in that had a much more fragile respiratory system when they went underground. And if the canary died, the miner knew there was poisonous gas and he had to get out. Right? Black folk, by every measure in this country, serve as the miner's canary on these social questions. If, if there are difficulties in making your payment as a renter, you can pretty much guarantee that that's coming for everybody else. 
if there's ways to make profit off of student loans, off of payday lending, off of keeping students with fewer options, and again, renters with fewer, fewer options, that begins oftentimes in these smaller contexts and then gets mapped onto the wider system. So the point here is that if we begin to believe again in having robust public spending, creating more public options, public land, public schools, pu you know, various forms of public employment that actually has, in many cases, union benefits, then you begin to see how you rebuild the middle class in the way it was built the first time coming out of the 1930s. As long as you believe that the government is an ins instrument of waste, that it, it basically caves to the needs of interest groups, that it caves to the needs of you know, loud minorities, then you're going to leave people in a position to not have a standing to negotiate for better goods and services. When the Jim Crow era was at its peak, black folk would literally show up with their property tax receipts and say, I demand that you build seating in the stadium because I'm, my, my tax money is going toward providing stadium seating and I don't get any access to it. When you wanted a beach, you went with your tax receipts down to the city council and said, we demand there to be a Negro-only beach, Negro-only waiting room and so forth. Taxes became the way that you could hold the government accountable. We don't even have a positive relationship with taxes anymore. Everyone's trying to pay fewer taxes, right? There's no sense that you're getting something for your tax money. So the key to having a, a better relationship and more options is in fact changing how we even regard taxes and the way in which we can hold our public official accountable for filling the coffers that we all pay at least 35% into every year, right? So, so it's, 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 a, it's a relationship that is economic as much as it is cultural. I was saying this earlier during a radio show that we have a, a culture that already thinks about cutting taxes and only providing breaks for corporations and not recognize. And if you put more money in people's pockets and reduce taxes and give them greater say over how the government operates, you in fact generate a stronger economy, which was done, but also create much more robust public institutions. Join me in thanking Dr. Nathan Connolly for coming again. We'll see some of you again this afternoon.